So, <coughs> welcome to the first Sunday of Advent and the book of Daniel. I bet y'all have never heard that in church before, have you? <laughs> One of the challenges and blessings of uh, following the narrative lectionary is that we often get these scriptures that don't necessarily go along with what we are celebrating in the life of the church. You see, the majority of our Christian brothers and sisters in the denomination follow the Revised Common Lectionary, and the Revised Common Lectionary is based upon the church year. So those scriptures go much better with the special days and seasons of worship in the life of the church. But we follow the Narrative Lectionary. The Narrative Lectionary runs chronologically through scripture, telling us the whole story from the beginning. <coughs> well, there's no real end yet, is there? But from the beginning on out. And so with that, sometimes we get scriptures that don't necessarily go with what we are celebrating in the life of the church. And as the person who is responsible for trying to make those connections, I can tell you it is very frustrating from time to time. They didn't prepare me in seminary to preach on the book of Daniel during Advent. We're only supposed to preach on Isaiah and the Gospels. That's it. But one of the blessings about having new scripture in an old season is finding new ways for that scripture to connect to our lives. And so as we do walk through this season of Advent, and as we encounter scripture that we may not expect, let us try to find ways for these new scriptures to encounter and connect with our life. If you think about it chronologically, the book of Daniel almost makes sense, actually, during the season of Advent. Let's go back a few weeks and think about where we have been. Over the past few weeks, we've talked about the history of the people of God. We had the divided kingdom, the north and the south. We had the prophet Amos, who was prophesying to the kingdom in the north, saying, we're going to be in trouble, the Assyrians are coming. We have the prophet Isaiah in the south, saying, we're going to be in trouble, the Assyrians are coming. The Assyrians have taken over the northern kingdom and are at the gates of the southern kingdom. And then King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon takes over the Assyrians, and the Assyrians are coming at the gates and then take over Jerusalem and send the Jewish people into exile. Last week, we had a letter from Jeremiah. Jeremiah's letter said to the people who were living in exile, invest in the city where you are. Build houses, get married, plant gardens, have children and grandchildren. Or when you invest in the welfare of the city, <coughs> You invest in your welfare as well. The context of the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are exiles in Babylon who have taken Jeremiah's advice. They have not only invested in the Babylonians, they are actually officials in the government, possibly even in the court of King Nebuchadnezzar himself. Now what's interesting about it is even though that is the context of where this takes place, people living in exile, having taken the prophet's, the prophet's advice, the words of Daniel were not actually written down until some 400 years after that time in the life of the people. But even though that's when it happens, it is still important to pay attention to these stories. Now what's interesting about this story and why it comes up here so we have the Babylonian captivity, which is around the 6th century BCE, and we have when these stories are written down, which is around the 2nd century BCE, and something very interesting is happening in the life of the people yet again. The people are no longer in exile, they are living in their homeland, but their homeland has been overtaken by yet another foreign power, the Seleucid Empire. And the Seleucids are more vigorous or more strict in their attempt to control the Jewish people. They made certain laws and decrees. They said, basically, you can no longer be Jewish. You cannot worship the Lord your God. You cannot 
contain or keep a Torah. You cannot follow the laws of God. And what's more, you must worship these other foreign gods, our gods. So even though the people were living in their home, the powers that be were pressuring them to lose their relationship with God. Do you see why the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who were told to worship a false god, was important to these people in this time in their life? That is the context of the book of Daniel. Now what about Advent? Well, Advent is a season for us to recollect the hope of the coming of Christ and to look forward to the Lord's coming again. That's the official PCUSA statement on Advent, by the way. Our, uh, we examined our new elders this morning, and I'll bet you anything, if I asked them to give me the reference in the book of order where to find that, they probably couldn't find it, but they could tell you how to find it. <laughs> by the way, it's in the W section. Advent is a season to recollect the hope of the coming of Christ, and to look forward to the Lord's coming again. I like that word, recollect. I don't think we use it enough. To recollect the hope of the coming of Christ means that we take time to understand what it meant for people to need a Savior. It's very easy at this time of year to focus on the world that Jesus was born into. The world of the Jews that was being overtaken by the Roman Empire, who were being oppressed by the Romans, and people who needed relief from the oppression of the Romans. But the recollection goes back further. We have been lucky enough to go through the whole story of the children of Israel. And there have been many times over the thousands of years of their existence that they had a hope for salvation, hope for a Messiah, hope for the Lord to come into their world and into their lives. When they were in bondage in the land of Egypt, they hoped to be released. When they were wandering lost in the desert, they hoped to be found. For the many years they lived in chaos under the time of judges, when everyone did what was right in their own eyes, they hoped for salvation. When the enemies overcame them, when they were pushed into exile, they hoped for the Lord who would save them. To recollect the hope of the coming of the Lord means that we recollect all of the hope of the children of God who needed a Savior in their lives. And we look forward to the Lord coming again. The Lord who came in the form of a baby that we celebrate on Christmas, we look forward to the time when the Lord will come again. Not only into our lives, but into this world. We know what it looked like the first time, right? If not, there's a little manger scene out there. We know what it looked like the first time. And we are wondering and looking forward to and hoping about what it will be like the next time. That is the season of Advent. Now, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and the fiery furnace. In this story, remember, this is a story to give hope and faith to a people being oppressed. This story is in part an act of civil disobedience. You have Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego living in the Babylonian Empire. They had taken on good roles in the government. There were satraps or something like that. And King Nebuchadnezzar has decided that all people must worship this one golden statue. And the opponents of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego know they are not going to do this. And so they call the king's attention to this. And they say, sorry, it's not going to happen. We're not going to worship your gods. We worship our gods. Their actual words, and they're a little different in each translation, so I'll try to get it right, is Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego say, O king, if our God will save us, then 
well and good. But if not, we will continue to serve our God. <coughs> Just think about that for a moment. They know the consequences for not worshiping the idol. They're not going to do it. And they say, if, O oh king, our God decides to save us, great. And if not, great. Did you catch the impact of that? They are not saying we worship our God because God will save us. They are saying we worship and serve our God who might save us. And if not, we worship and serve our God anyway. That is a powerful, powerful statement. And of course we know what happens, right? They do get saved. There is a stranger taking on the presence of a God there in the furnace with them. And somehow they come out of the furnace unsinged. You know, a lot of thought and speculation has gone into who that stranger is in the furnace with them. Uh, and I spent a lot of time this week studying over it and praying over it and wondering about it myself. And you can find people who say it was God who came and took the form of a man. It was an angel or a messenger from God, some divine being with supernatural powers that saved them. Some even look back and say, well, that was obviously Jesus who was in the furnace with them. I can tell you after reading all the ideas and praying over it, I can tell you for sure, I don't know who it was. <laughs> it was from the dude. It never tells us in scripture. And at some point I, this week, I came to realize, <gasps> we just kind of got to be okay with that. There's this mysterious figure in the furnace with them. We don't know who he or she is. But we know that in their time of need, that figure was right there with them. In their time of need, they were not alone. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace. So how does that connect? This is the season of Advent. Today we lit the candle of hope. Remember the words of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. O king, if our God will save us, well and good. If not, we will still serve our God. They were not confident God was going to save them. But I'm pretty sure they were right down hopeful. Right? They were hopeful God was going to save them. And it's a powerful statement because they are saying, God may not save us, but we still love and serve our God. During this time of year, we are looking forward to the Lord coming again. Like I said earlier, we don't know what that's going to look like. Some of us may not even believe it's ever going to happen, but we still hope. Every year we participate in the season of Advent. Every year we light the candles. Every year we read the words. We sing the songs. Even the songs we don't want to sing just yet. We sing the songs for the season to prepare us for Christ who is coming again into the world. And we don't know what that looks like. It's mysterious, we have no direct answers, but still we hope. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego hoped they would be saved. They didn't know how it was going to happen. They didn't know if it was going to happen. Every year we hope Christ will come again into our lives and into this world. Amen? Amen.